the USO tour abroad, she was kissed and groped against her will by comedian Al Franken, who is now a fairly well-known Democratic senator representing the state of Minnesota. Trace Gallagher has been on this story all day, and he joins us with the latest. Trace? Tucker, the allegations you mentioned come from the radio and television personality who says the growing Me Too movement is what gave her the courage to fight back against a sitting U.S. senator. Radio news anchor Leanne Tweeden is accusing Al Franken actually in two separate incidents that happened during that USO tour back in 2006 when Franken was then a cast member for Saturday Night Live, including one that happened during a rehearsal for a skit that Tweeden would consider sexual assault. Here she is. Put his hand on the back of my head, and he mashed his face against. I mean, it happened so fast, and he just mashed his his lips against my face, and he stuck his tongue in my mouth so fast. I remember I pushed him off with my hands, and I said, "If you ever do that to me again, I'm not going to be so nice about it the second time." The second incident is this picture taken on a plane ride home from the tour, where she claims that Al Franken groped her while she was asleep. Al Franken says he doesn't recall the rehearsal incident the way Tweeden does, but he did apologize, saying, and I'm quoting, I respect women. I don't respect men who don't. And that fact that my own actions have given people a good reason to doubt that makes me feel ashamed. As for the photograph, Franken says, quote, I don't know what was in my head when I took that picture, and it doesn't matter. There's no excuse. I look at it now, and I feel disgusted with myself. Democratic leaders immediately called for a Senate Ethics Committee investigation with Chuck Schumer saying, quote, sexual harassment is never acceptable and must not be tolerated. I hope and expect that the Ethics Committee will fully investigate this troubling incident, as they should with any credible allegation of sexual harassment. Al Franken says that he will fully cooperate with the investigation, though Politico is now reporting there's already talk among some Democrats that because the picture we showed you earlier is so damaging, that Al Franken might be forced to resign. Tucker. Trace Gallagher from L.A. Thanks a lot, Trace. Chad McMoore is a journalist and a frequent guest on the show. He joins us from New York tonight. So, uh, Chad, I know Al Franken pretty well. I've known him for a long time. I honestly never thought of him as a sexual harasser. I have thought of him a lot as a not a very nice person who, and this is an open secret in Washington, who mistreats his staff. He's a screamer who takes credit for other people's work, is basically horrible to those beneath him. And all of that, and I've seen it, has been excused for many years because his politics are mainstream politics here. He's a liberal. And I see this as a theme. Like, if you have the right politics, you get away with kind of whatever you want. You're excused by the left. Am I making that up in my mind? You certainly aren't making that up in your mind. That is that that is how it is. Look at Hollywood. Look at everything that's happening now. All these allegations that are coming down. Uh, and even just aside from basic hypocrisy, right, we have the everyone, everyone on the left, especially who's coming after Roy Moore, who's been coming after Roy Moore. Now, you know, when it's their own team, they don't know what to do. This isn't merely hypocrisy. There's something far more sinister, I believe, happening on the left when they've built a, a party platform that basically tells people like women, like gays, like blacks, that you're victims and we're here to protect you and the other side hates you. And then what happens when people come out, especially in these allegations now, well, sometimes the women are attacked uh, by the left. You know, uh, Joy Behar famously called Bill Clinton's uh, accusers tramps. Uh, so you, it, it became, becomes even more sinister when you realize that they don't care about these people, about these groups that they purport to be standing up for. They only care about one thing, and that one thing is power. Yeah, accumulating power. I've always yeah. thought that the root of all wisdom was knowing how flawed you are, and that's a hedge against self-righteousness. But I've noticed, and particularly in the case of Al Franken, an overweening self-righteousness. I mean, Franken is the first one to stand up in a hearing and lecture people about how he's a lot better than they are. Do you <laughs> see a connection between outward expressions of self-righteousness and people's secret personal behavior? Am I imagining that too? Uh, I, I absolutely, I absolutely agree with you. Uh, there, I heard someone say the other day, as soon as you hear a man call himself a feminist, you can start the clock on the rape charges. <laughs> <laughs> I believe it was uh, Milo Yiannopoulos who said that. Uh, it's absolutely true. The more your virtue signaling, you see this a lot with race, right? And yeah. I've noticed this my entire life. You see this a lot with with these sort of white liberal race virtue signalers who, who are all day long talking about Black Lives Matter. Yet they're the first person to to cross the street if a black man's walking towards them late at night. Right. They're the first person to be, you know 
know, very rude to their uh, their their brown skin nanny or what have you. It's it's, it's so obvious that, the, that there's some sort of cover going here. When you see someone who is trying so hard to virtue signal that they care for people, uh, the, these groups of people. Well, maybe you should look up look at that. You know, if it's they need true. to collectivize people like it's that. It's true. I I once asked Al Sharpton if he was a bigot, and he said to me in a moment of candor, he said, you know, the only group I really don't like, white liberals, because they patronize me. <laughs> and I thought, that, you know, there's something to this. I don't, I'm not a shrink, so I don't fully understand the syndrome here, but it's related. People who have thoughts they're ashamed of tend to attack other people uh, and accuse them of having those thoughts. I oh, absolutely. I completely agree with you. And that and that spans the gamut when, you know, <laughs> people who maybe are a little too puritanical and some things turn out to have the uh, the nastiest secret behind their closet as well, you know? Yeah. And so I would say Senator Franken uh, is in that category. I, Chabot, thank I you. That was right. insightful. I appreciate This Uranium One story has been debunked countless times. It is nothing but a, a you know, a false charge that... Uh, the Trump administration is uh, trying to drum up in order to avoid uh, attention being directed at them. This is such an abuse of power, and it goes right at the rule of law. If they send a signal that we're going to be like some dictatorship, some authoritarian regime where political opponents are going to be unfairly, uh, fraudulently investigated, uh, that rips at the fabric of the uh, contract we have that we can trust our justice system. Really? Hillary talking about the rule of law and the possibility of a special counsel to investigate her role in that whole corrupt Uranium One deal? She's obviously getting nervous here with more reaction. Author of the best-selling book, Clinton Cash. Really? We're going to get a lecture on the rule of law? You know, I, I watch people now assail you. Even the never Trump crowd is now trying to come to the defense, I noticed, of Hillary Clinton. I want to give you a chance to respond and explain to people all of the connections here. I'll hand it to you. Well, thanks, Sean. Um, look, um, this is a story that begins in 2005. Uh, Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton helped Frank Justra, a Canadian investor, get very, very rich uranium deposits in Kazakhstan from the Kazakh government. And we now have a video deposition from the Kazakh um, uranium minister at the time going into detail about how they were extorted by then-Senator Hillary Clinton to grant those concessions to Frank Justra. She was on the Armed Services Committee. She would not meet with Kazakh officials. Her committee had responsibility for the distribution of funds that were supposed to go to Kazakhstan. She made it clear, no uranium for Justra. You are not going to get your support from the federal government. Um, after Juster got those uranium deposits, he spent, sent $30 million to the Clinton Foundation. What is the timeline on that? Yeah, so that's 2005 is when that deal happens. Within two months, he, spent, he sends the first $30 million to the Clinton Foundation. 2007, they do what's called a reverse merger. They take those Kazakh assets, they put them in a company called Uranium One. Uranium One acquires uranium assets in the United States. In 2010, the Russian government says, we want to buy Uranium One. That triggers the federal approval of the United States. As the U.S. federal government and the State Department is considering that deal, the chairman of Uranium One, Ian Telfer, sends $2.35 million to the Clinton Foundation through a private foundation. It was never disclosed. It was only discovered by going through Canadian tax records. Bill Clinton gives a half a million dollar speech the month as that approval is going through to a, a company in, in Russia that is involved financially with Uranium One. The ties and the deals go on and on. And let me just add, Sean, by the way, it's about to get a lot more interesting because we know some details about this lobbyist, this, uh, uh, this source that's come forward. His name is William Campbell. He lives in Florida. He was with Cassidy and Associates, which is one of the big lobbying firms in, in D.C., where he lobbied on Russian interests from 2007 to 2008. He then started his own firm, was paid $50,000 a month by the Russians for lobbying. And this is what his contract was for, quote, to improve the media and political environment in the U.S. in respect to the surprise of the Russian uranium products, and, quote, to set up meetings in, with U.S. administration officials, 
members of Congress, and other key opinion elite in Tenex and Russian government officials. So the, this is a very inside guy just, that's coming forward as this whistleblower. Russia, we, we had Putin bad actors in the United States. Mueller was the FBI director. Eric Holder was one of the nine that signed off on the deal, Cipius deal, um, the committee. Then you've got bribery, extortion, kickbacks, money laundering, and racketeering. Mueller had to know because they had an FBI informant. He had his own personal experience, ended up four years being an informant. Then he got tapes, and then we've got documents, and we got emails and a firsthand account. And Putin was using all of, breaking all of these laws to get a foothold in the uranium market. And they knew in 2009. Yeah. You're right, Sean. In fact, the purchase of Uranium One was announced by Vladimir Putin himself. It was reported in the Moscow Times, which is an English language publication in Moscow. He personally released the funds to purchase Uranium One in the United States. And look, the argument that the Clinton defenders use is, well, there were all these government agencies that were involved in this process. She didn't do it by herself. From the standpoint of bribery, that is irrelevant. If you're a congressman sitting on a committee and a committee votes unanimously for something, but you got paid to vote for that, it doesn't matter what your colleagues did. You committed bribery, yeah. and that's why this needs to be investigated. All right, Peter, we're going to stay on this. And by the way, the FBI informant I was just talking about, his name was revealed today. We have John Solomon, Sarah Carter coming.